But I think um, just thinking about where are the places and spaces where people can just be uh, and how that contributes. I mean, we're talking about health, but I think what often gets short shrift is mental health um, in addition to uh, physical health. I'm excited to report to you that uh, in, in San Antonio, this time on our east side, we do have a very exciting experiment in comprehensive community development that is a result of a collaborative effort at the grassroots level to obtain federal funding for programs that are designed to improve neighborhoods, strengthen neighborhoods, and to look outside of just individual issues, but at all the intersections. So the area that we're focusing on, we're calling East Point, and the center of that area is a, an obsolete public housing development and a, a public middle school, an SAISD, Wheatley Middle School. And the city of San Antonio, the San Antonio Independent School District, the United Way, uh, St. Philip's College and several other key partners have all come together to transform the quality of life. And though we started out just focusing on education and housing, we've realized that there are so many other issues that we need to deal with. And that at the end of the day, if we don't provide opportunities for people to be healthy and whole, that they won't be able to be contributing uh, members of the neighborhood and we won't have the stability that we're seeking. So hopefully in uh, five years, I'll be able to come back and report some wonderful results. We've had made some great progress so far, uh, but that's just one example. And so hopefully through, through conferences like this, we'll be able to elevate the dialogue and get to the point of making some actions that uh, kind of turn the tide so that we can make the kind of public policy decisions that would allow all of us to enjoy a healthy quality of life. Uh, in the session that I was in this morning, uh, Elizabeth from the Federal Reserve Bank, uh, she, I wrote down some notes of one of the things that she said. She showed a slide that showed the expect life expectancy for people based on their zip code in, um, I can't remember what city it was that she showed, showed it for. Oh, it was New Orleans. And so it showed how in this one zip code, your life expectancy was 77, and in the other it was 55, and it was, wasn't very far away. And also the, a statistic that she shared was that, nine, I think it was about 80% of your health outcomes were dictated based on uh, behavior and environment and not as a result of health, actual health care, what your doctor tells you to do or medicines that you take. So I think those are really important things for us to think about as far as how we can be uh, healthy, whole individuals and communities. And I challenge all of you to not just think about it and talk about it today, but to be about it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Laura Esparza. I uh, work for the Institute for Health Promotion Research at UT Health Science Center in San Antonio, and I'm also vice chair of the Active Living Council of San Antonio. There are many ways to be physically active, including exercising and playing sports. There's also active living, which is a way of life that integrates physical activity into our daily routines, such as walking to the grocery store, riding a bike to work, or walking to school. Being active is an important part of being healthy, but unfortunately, most youth and adults do not meet the physical activity guidelines. The Active Living Council is a community group committed to making it easier for every person in San Antonio to be physically active. Our primary goal is to influence policy and programs that remove barriers and support a healthy lifestyle and environment. Active Living Council is made up of representatives from every segment of the community, and we produce the Active Living Plan for a Healthier San Antonio, a roadmap for transforming San Antonio into an active living community. Active Living Council is now a committee of the Mayor's Fitness Council, and we are working closely with the Mayor's Fitness Council to implement the Active Living Plan. For more information on the Active Living Council and the plan, be sure to check out the postcard that is inside your conference packet, or go to fitcitysa.com, or stop by the Mayor's Fitness Council table in the foyer. With respect to helping San Antonio become an active living community, where are we now and where do we want to go? What is it that makes a town an active town? 
and can San Antonio become one? Today we have a special guest who will talk to us about just that. John Simmerman has been in the health promotion business for more than 25 years. Pursuing his passion for promoting active lifestyle at the community level, he founded Advocates for Healthy Communities. He spearheaded the Active Towns Tour, visiting towns around the country to study what makes a town an active town and the steps we can take to activate our own communities. And a couple of fun facts about John. When not on the Active Town Tour, he divides his time between Hawaii and Colorado. Think about it. John flew from Hawaii uh, on Monday this week, arriving in San Antonio about five in the morning. He rode on his bike from the airport to his hotel in downtown San Antonio. Okay, raise your hand if you've ever done that. John has great experiences to share and many ideas to share with us, so please welcome John Simmerman. Actively standing. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Thank you for the uh, Reserve Bank for helping fund and make this happen. Uh, and a special thanks uh, to Mr. David Clear. Everybody up, come on. We're going to do some active practice, some active applause here. That's a pound of Kona coffee right there. So active applause. Hey, I got, I got chicken skin. That's, that's, uh, that's Hawaiian for goosebumps. Um, there's something special to this concept of getting up and moving. And uh, Laura and I experienced this in San Diego um, in March at the Active Living Research Conference. And this is the first time I've ever heard of active applause. And um, guess what? We're going to get you up and moving a couple of times today because there's some good stuff happening in San Antonio. Wouldn't you say so? All right, get up. Come on, one more time. Is, wouldn't you say so? Yes. I promise I won't be that exuberant every time. But I will be asking some serious questions. So I'm going to pause a couple of times during the presentation to just ask your feedback. And, I, and I, I had to promise David that I would get you moving, you know, kind of shake off the lunch. It's always hard, you know, either, you know, being the last speaker or, you know, right after lunch, you're, you're trickling in. Thank you so much for, for sticking around. And let's dive in. Every tour, every journey begins with that first step. Here's me at about 18 months in Los Angeles. This is where it all began. And you know, it's, it's one of those weird sort of things. You know, when you look back at your life and you kind of re recall activity and things that you're doing. And as kids, we're amazingly adaptable. Uh, the family moved from Los Angeles up to Northern California, up to a little ranch. And the next thing I knew, I was wearing cowboy boots and you know, raising horses, sheep, and cattle, and doing all this, you know, cool stuff. Um, I put this one in for Chuck. That's a Twins hat on there, Chuck. Uh, he's a Minnesota Twins fan. And what happens with many of us, though, is we lose a big part of that activity. So when I was going to school, I became passionate about preventing disease. Not simply treating disease, but preventing disease. And so I really got into, into that aspect in, in my, my uh, studies that you see there, you know, in the, in the area of behavior change and behavior modification, ended up working for many large corporations, which happened to be, most, most often, they happened to be self-insured. I had an opportunity to move to uh, Boulder in 1996 from Chicago and was able to experience what it was like to live in an environment that actually you know, promotes and encourages physical activity. And to be completely honest, I moved to this place for one reason. It had a reputation of being a great place to train for triathlon. Okay? I picked up the habit, habit, yeah, I guess that's what it is. Some say it's a curse, uh, of, of triathlon when I lived in Chicago and I heard that this place was uh, just an awesome place to, to train. You had altitude, you have great weather. By the way, there's 300 days of sunshine 
in, in the Boulder area. Little did I know there were some other things that made it very, very special. In 2005, a job opportunity came up that allowed me to move to uh, Honolulu. And this began, be, you know, the, the odyssey that is where I'm at now, where I split my time about 50-50 between Hawaii and, um, and Boulder, Colorado. However, when I was in Honolulu, the environment was a shock. I could not ride my bike. I got very depressed. I sold my bike and said, you know what, the only place I feel safe is when I'm out in the water. Opportunity came up to get to uh, Kona, reinvigorated that passion for riding the bike. It felt safer on the Big Island. It felt safer in Kona. And that's when I got involved with bicycle and pedestrian advocacy work. So I took all that background in disease prevention and health promotion, working in the corporate arena for over 15 years, and suddenly had this epiphany of the built environment has a profound impact on our ability to live and lead a healthy life. And so, and that's how, also when I got involved with the Congress for New Urbanism and found out about strong towns and Chuck Marone and, and all of those discussions. Because one of the things that, that came up and really became part of my epiphany is that a strong town is also going to be an active town. So, here we are. Let's talk a little bit about activity. There you go, San Antonio. Hey, everybody needs activity. You really do. It, it's, it, it, we're designed to be active. And there's different types of activity. You know, you've got activity that is your programmed, you know, I'm going to put my exercise clothes on and go out and do an activity. And you've got, you know, the other side of, uh, of activity, which is, you know, called the utilitarian type of activity. And utilitarian types of activity include, you know, things like meeting your daily needs. So here's a picture of folks walking in LA. If anybody remembers music from the 80s, you know, somebody said nobody ever walks in LA. Here's proof, they do. And by the way, there's a, a metro station, a subway station right there um, that I was able to take to get to a conference in, in LA. But we also have play and recreation. There's fun involved with that. And, and by the way, it's, it's okay for, for you all to have fun now that you're an adult. I'm not sure if everybody knows that or not. Um, meditative movement, too. Thinking about, hey, I just need to, to stroll around, get some nature in, and de-stress. Providing opportunities such as this. I don't know if this is very easy to see in, in the back there. It's a little dark. But my point of this slide is to, is to really highlight and illustrate that you've got a mixture of different types. So these folks, this is a recreational outing. And by the way, this is brutally cold too. You see the snow there. It's, a, it's actually a pretty cold day. But these kids are walking home for, from school. So you have a single type of environment facility serving different types of activity. So, and here's another uh, slide illustrating that as well. Completely different environment. This is in Lodo. This is very urban. You've got this, uh, you know, this lady just did some shopping. You've got the bike parked here. That's probably somebody who is either picking something up. Maybe it's one of the workers that are there. And so it's an environment where, again, you're getting a mixture of different types of active living. So. I mentioned earlier that we're, we're designed to move, and I'm, I, I'm very, very careful about, um, uh, uh, about saying those words because it's actually quite true. I mean, heck, even Santa Claus is designed to move. Look at Santa Claus there. He's right up there with Bree Wee, our, our local uh, uh, professional triathlete in, in Kona. So when I say that we're designed to move, what I really mean is this is a very, very recent trend in the history of man where we are living sedentary lifestyles and se sedentary lives day in and day out. And in fact, if you take a look at every single major health issue that we're dealing with, sedentary living and inactivity is a ma major risk factor to those ailments. So, but 
we got a lazy gene, don't we? <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite, favorite photos. Um, so, but I'm serious, we really do have a lazy gene. So the other thing that is, is critical to know is that yes, we're designed to move. We have the ability to accomplish amazing things from a physical perspective, but we also are pre-designed to conserve energy whenever we can, and it usually takes a little bit of effort, a little initiative on our part to be able to overcome that escalator and choose the stairs. Sometimes it's a matter of will, sometimes it's a matter of programming in terms of how we design our environment to encourage um, activity. And I love this photo. This is the bl a blow up of the, of the uh, photo from two, uh, two slides ago because you just see the joy on the faces here. There is nothing more natural to humans than being active, okay? Nothing more natural. So, now it's your turn. I've got my volunteers, they've got their mics that are gonna be um, able to get to you. I wanna get a couple of examples. What are your fondest childhood memories of activity? Anybody, real quick, we're gonna do this quick fire. So any examples? Wiffle ball. ball, okay, that was good. We didn't need a, a mic for that one. Tree climbing, okay, a couple more. Dancing. Dancing, perfect. What do you think? I think that deserves some active applause. Everybody up, come on. Come on, bring it up, bring it up, bring the level up. So by the way, I actually use a stand-up desk. I do not sit. The reason I do not sit is after about five to 10 minutes of continuous sitting, your body starts ratcheting down your basal metabolic system. Some amazing studies have come out of the UK recently that takes a look at just how devastating sitting is. So there's a rhyme to my reason here of getting you up and, and trying to bring some uh, invigoration to this. Okay, diving in. Let's talk about the Active Towns Initiative. So, we founded the Active Towns Initiative um, just about a year or so ago, and um, really it was as the result of a study that I did, some surveys that I did um, with um, support from the Ironman Foundation, where I actually interviewed Ironman distance triathletes. And the reason I chose those, that, those weirdos, okay, and I'm one of them, um, is that they're out there on our streets training every single day. If you want to understand how conducive to physical activity your environment is, who better to ask than the person who's walking, biking, out in the, in the neighborhoods at all times, and probably also, by the way, getting in three to four different swimming uh, uh, exercises in as well, okay? So I talked with these folks and I said, well, how do you rate your city? How do you rate the place where you live? How do you rate your town? And the numbers were just coming back so incredibly positive. I'm like, what's wrong with these people? Are they like literally that high off endorphins? And after doing some focus interviews with them, something came out. These individuals, and there's something you need to understand about the typical Ironman distance triathlete as well. When you look at their, their demographics of this particular group, their household income is well over six figures, okay? You've got a lot of CEOs, you've got a lot of doctors, you've got a lot of very driven type A people who are out there. I'm so not that, but whatever. Um, and this is what they said. They said the reason why we're rating our town so highly is because we moved to this place. It was already a wonderful environment. When they decided to move to Park City, when they decided to move to Boulder, when they decided to go to these places, these places already had a culture of physical activity. So of course, what did I think? How the heck did these places get this way? That's what I wanted to explore. And so I set out to try to understand and try to explore how these places came about, and Kaiser Permanente was generous enough to help fund uh, last year's travel. I made it to, oh gosh, 20 some odd states, and this is the 86th city in about 12 months time. 
We launched the tour last May at uh, CNU in Salt Lake City. And um, what a wild ride. And guess what? I've got 21 more states to visit, actually 20 now since I've made it to here, and another 75 targeted cities that I'm hearing through the grapevine um, that are really cool happening places. They're either already an active town or they're getting there, they're emerging. So, I am, and, and, and you'll see there, there's a Facebook up there. I'm very active uh, on the active towns in Facebook. But what are active towns? Well, these are, these are walkable places. We heard Chuck talk about this earlier. These places are bikeable. Take a look at this photo. It's a boring photo, right? It's of a bike rack, but that bike rack photo makes me smile every time. This is mid-February. It's brutally cold, and all these middle schoolers at KC Middle School rode their bike to school. That is a really, really cool thing. These are memorable places. These are places where people will go to visit, and they talk about, and they rave about these places. They're desirable. Madison, Wisconsin, on the Livability Index, rated number five. Again, there is a quality of life aspect to these places when they're active towns. And they're truly lovable. People were passionate about this place. They said, John, you're going to be in the upper you know, Midwest. You have got to take a drive. I was up visiting Chuck in, in Brainerd. You have got to take a drive across the UP into and visit Mackinac Island. Okay? Mackinac Island. Who, who's been to Mackinac Island? Handful of folks. Pretty special place, right? Do you realize that is our really our only car-free city that we have in the United States? It's completely car-free, has always been car-free. They actually banned automobiles in, I believe it was 1896, even before automobiles became the thing. They were thinking about something there. Okay, so what is it I'm looking for when I'm out there? I'm looking for activity assets. I want to better understand how the entire environment, and it's not just walking and biking, but it's part of it. You know, it's, it is the trails. It's, it's the, the, the friendliness here. But it's also the additional aspects to activity. Again, both utilitarian and non-utilitarian, both you know, that the program stuff as well as being able, being able to live your daily life. It's, you know, we, we heard uh, somebody talk about, you know, community gardens. So there's that part of it. And again, access to nature. Somebody mentioned street trees. Um, do you know, what, you, you know what trees are um, in, in traffic engineering parlance? Anybody can shout it out? Trees? Street trees? Well, it, yeah, it is. It's, it's, F an, it's an FHO, a fixed hazardous object. Okay? That's, what, that's the way they're looking at street trees. When I see street trees, what I think of, this is providing a wonderful environment. It's an inviting environment that gives me shade. There's something that's really, truly amazing about when you go down on the river walk and that temperature is down. You've got all that shade canopy. Pretty cool stuff. Okay. We're also looking, to, to Chuck's point, we're looking at the land use patterns. How do the land use patterns drive and dictate physical activity on a day in and day out basis? And a, a big part of this is, is access and proximity, things of that nature. I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but just so you know, when I visit a city and do a comprehensive report, these are what I'm looking at in terms of the the, the activity assets. What we're hopefully going to have is get some metrics to these things. Some of these are actual physical things that are on the ground, and some of them are programming. Some of it's part of the culture. But we want to be able to quantify this and create something we're calling an activity score so that a, a city can kind of see where they're at and see how they mesh out in terms of being an established active town, an emerging active town, an aspiring active town, or maybe they are a latent active town. Okay. I think we've seen, we've seen versions of this in, in a couple of the earlier presentations. This is certainly an auto-oriented, um, auto-centric, latent active town. There's, there's pockets 
of activity that could be happening in any of these places, but on a whole, they've got some challenges. So when I'm looking at an aspiring active town um, or neighborhood, they're starting to get it. They're just at the very beginning stages. This is Dexter, Michigan. This pathway provided an absolutely critical connection to a community that was completely cut off from their downtown. The kids could have literally thrown a stone from their homes that they couldn't get to, you know, they, they could literally toss that stone to the downtown area, but they couldn't get there unless they were driven because there was no connections and the road had such a, a dangerous um, uh, underpass that they were not able to get through. So there was a barrier. So this created connectivity. So you'll hear that word time and time again is connectivity. Emerging active towns, these are the places that, yeah, they get it. They're already actively working on those tactical urbanism types of things. And sometimes it doesn't look like urbanism at all. Sometimes it looks like this in Saranac Lake, where you know, they gave me a call. The Saranac Lake is, is just up the road from, uh, from Lake Placid. They, they gave me a call and said, John, you got to get up here to upstate New York. We're an active town. We're proud about it. It's part of our marketing. It's part of what we are, our vision. And when I got up there, this is Josh. He happens to be the uh, state bike and ped coordinator or, or bicycle coordinator uh, for the state of, uh, of uh, New York. And this is a great example of cross-purposing. So in the wintertime, the, this is a ski, cross-country ski path right here, but then perpendicular to it in the summertime, that is a removable portion of that, that particular um, segment that he's holding there. That's part of the mountain biking trail. So they're repurposing, they're keeping things active, keeping their assets active all year round. And then, of course, our established active towns. These are the places that when I ask somebody, hey, what place have you been to that you were just blown away? You come back home and you're raving. You're just like, wow, we didn't have to get in the car a single bit. And it was fun. It was invigorating. We, you know, and hey, can, can we get a little bit more of that when we come back? So I wanted to study what was part of the DNA of these established active towns and how they got to where they are, okay? So once again, what places come to mind for you? And this time I really do want the, the microphone in somebody's hand. Can somebody give me an active town or, a sta or an established or an emerging active town? And not San Antonio because you are emerging. But raise your hand and we'll have the mic get to you. Yes, right here in front. Philadelphia. Philadelphia, emerging or already established? She says established. i got to get to Philadelphia. Fort Collins, Colorado. Fort Collins, Colorado. One of the other platinum League of American Bicycle, bicycle-friendly cities. That's a no-brainer. Anchorage, Alaska. Emerging. Anchorage, Alaska. I have not heard that. One more, and then we got to keep going. She's working on the mic over there. Just shout it out. What's your city? Just shout it out. She's in Austin. You bet. Uh, that's what the, the next stop on the Active Towns Tour is Austin. Okay, so when I talk about a culture of activity, I mean it permeates through all aspects of life. I was out for a morning run on a very, very cold morning there in Boulder and ran across this little guy. He was riding his bike to school. The smile on his face was just ear to ear. He was having a ball. Um, this group here, this is some friends, they were out having a noon committee meeting. I kid you not. You want to talk about corporate wellness programming and things of that nature? They're programming activity throughout all aspects of their life. Go for a walk. Steve Jobs was, was famous about going for walks. Hey, take a look at this. Afternoon commute in Madison. This is a bicycle pr pr priority area here. They're going to wait for this traffic to clear out, and then they're through, and they're super, super casual about it. There's no stress or mess there. Evening practice in Kailua Kona, so recreation types of activities, opportunities for you to connect with friends and other colleagues and things of that nature. Absolutely critical, especially if you have an environment like that in Kailua Kona. But what if your environment is like this in Brooklyn? You know, six degrees, and we're still seeing all these different people walking and biking 
in Brooklyn on a very, very cold day. This was one of the uh, Arctic plunges. Yes, I, I do travel in, in the wintertime. And uh, here's a great example of, of civic identity. I mean, the bicycle in Davis is actually the logo for the city. This is civic pride in identity. It's part of what they present forward as being you know, critical to them. This particular um, facility is much like your river walk in the sense that it connects to all sorts of meaningful places, recreation activities like this soccer field over here. These housing over here are mid to low income housing. It connects down to downtown. These are meaningful ways that people can get activity in. And please keep in mind from an equity perspective that active transportation is oftentimes by necessity for people who do not have the means to support an automobile at eight to nine thousand dollars per year. And here's a great example in Los Angeles of the fact that every transit ride begins with somebody either being a pedestrian or a bicycle rider or somebody that got a ride or got dropped off, et cetera. We need to think broadly about how people are getting around uh, on a day in and day out basis and think of it from the, the lens of you know, everybody else's situations, so from an equitable perspective. So some of the key learnings that we've seen from the, the trip thus far of it's absolutely imperative to create an inviting and invigorating environment. Um, inviting, what I mean by that is it truly is welcoming. It welcomes somebody in. Invigorating is just that. I mean, think of the, the word invigorate. It energizes. It's something that, you know, you just, you can't help but want to go for a stroll when you have a place like the Riverwalk. Traditional land use patterns, once again, looking at the opportunity to exemplify those areas that were built on that. Every single city has a core of some traditional a land use pattern, try to reinvigorate that area. For the areas that are sprawled out and you don't have that, see what you can do to try to incorporate some of those aspects of development. And then we're going to talk about this in detail, streets for people and streets in transition. Also easy access to nature and other inviting and invigorating environments that are out there, including the workplace. And then Finally, creating community connections, engaging your communities. One of the things that, that Chuck talked about with the Neighborhoods First um, program was just that, you know, getting the community engaged and activated. If you can do that, you're going to have a lot better success because many good, well-intentioned programs get killed by NIMBYism. Okay, so isn't that just a beautiful picture? So this is Mackinac Island once again, and that is Highway M185. I'll say that again. That's Highway M185. That's the only highway in the, in the federal system that's a state highway where motor vehicles are not allowed. Pretty cool stuff. But again, I'm not going to really belabor this other than to say that a big part of the lens that I see things through is how do we create authentic environments that will truly motivate people to change their behavior? Okay? You know, all know we've got the carrot and the stick. This is, this is me saying that the carrot is a huge, huge part of it. The stick can be the policies and the legislation. You've got you know, aspects of that you can all kind of think about, some of them not as wonderful to think about. But really, what I'm saying to you is that when you create an environment that is truly inviting, people will, will do their best to change their behavior, especially if, the, especially if they're already working on trying to do so. Okay? And I'll show you some examples of how we can better do this from the standpoint of the things that we're building and putting on the ground, because you can't have this everywhere, right? Okay. So back to the, the traditional land use patterns, one of the wonderful things about my epiphany of understanding uh, land use and the built environment and, uh, and the Strong Towns movement was the, the realization that, wow, you know, if we get land use right, you can have something like this. 
a walking school district. This is actually Lakewood, Ohio. They do not have buses. They have never had buses. They don't need them. The kids all walk or bike to school. Boulder, Colorado, where you have created, a, they drew a blue line on the map, by the way, back in the 60s and 70s, and said, this is our urban growth boundary. And we're going to hold ourselves to no more than 2% growth on an annualized basis, year over year. And they've stuck to it. You get situations like this. So when you have, this is Brooklyn, by the way. And, and yes, I, I put this in for you, Chuck, because this is a, a, fire, uh, a fire truck. It was so cold that day that all the fire trucks were out checking to make sure that the fire hydrants um, still had water that could flow. They weren't completely frozen solid. They had no trouble getting around on these old, narrow streets. So they, they, they didn't seem stressed at all. But what I really want to point out here is that when we build and when we re-embrace this concept of traditional land use patterns, you have the value creation. You're able to create that prosperity that's so incredibly necessary for the vitality of the environment. And from my perspective, you now have money to be able to invest in the maintenance of some of these things that we're talking about, like golly gee whiz. I'd love to see it in Hawaii where the public restrooms at our most famous beaches are actually kept up. They look like they're from a third world. It's very, very embarrassing. So when you have that ability to have the value creation, to have the, the prosperity, you've got the money for the investment in the things that matter to quality of life, that matter to our health status as a society. So, streets for people. It was brought up in the conversation a little while, um, in the uh, session immediately after uh, Chuck's opening remarks about complete streets and about the challenge of trying to create streets that are, that are for people. I love this photo. This is in Miami. Uh, I love this photo because this is a convertible street in the daytime. This is a, an actual operating street. See that street sign right there, 15 miles per hour. And then come nighttime, they close it off and have a party every single day. Okay? It's a convertible street. This is a kid's size street. I love this street too. This is in Mission Beach down in the San Diego area. And uh, this little guy, he actually does pause. See the little, little look there? He actually does, he doesn't dash right across. He actually does look down, looks, looks both ways, make sure that it's safe for him to, to continue moving through. The, the community was just absolutely delightful with this. These used to be all motorized vehicle streets. And you see what happened is that as it became part of the, you know, public passageway, but also part of the private realm, became an extension of their home. It's beautiful to see. So, but what are most of our streets look like? Well, most of our streets kind of look like this. Um, and we're, we're sort of struggling with how we go through this transition period. How do we make a you know, the, these massively overwide streets with motor vehicles traveling at extremely high speeds, how do we somehow make them appropriate for pedestrians and for bicyclists? Well, the same right of way that you just saw on the previous slide in Salt Lake City, this is a different outcome. This is one block over, and you'll see an extremely wide public realm here, it call, also called a, 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 a sidewalk. You've got a shared lane th there in the middle, and you had transit in, in, in the, uh, the, the train, the light rail that they have here. I put this up just to make fun of it. It's, it's a complete street. Thank you very much. You did a great job. You've got a complete street. A complete street's nowhere. It's not fair, because so Fort Lauderdale was actually testing some things out. Hopefully, someday, they're going to be able to put some value on that street so that it's a complete street to somewhere. This is a complete street to the airport. So when I went to the conference in San Diego, I also rode to the airport and back. Now, sometimes I, I get in trouble for criticizing the ubiquitous white, white uh, sticks. Um, but what I try to emphasize with folks is that when we put things like that out, 
I want them to be considered transitionary. I want that to be tactical in the sense that we're trying to get somewhere else. This is what we really need to be thinking about. When you look at the fact that if you have a situation, a, a crash between a pedestrian or a cyclist and an automobile, and the automobile is traveling at 20 miles per hour, there's an 80% chance of survival. That's, those are pretty good odds. That's a major, major reason why we need to head in this direction when we have a realm where we're trying to mix bicyclists, pedestrians, and motor vehicles. Um, all you have to do is go up to as high as 35, 45 miles per hour, and then you're at an 80% fatality rate. Not the odds you want to be in. So design really does matter. I like this street in, in it's Spruce Street in Boulder. I like this street because it's a relatively quiet street. You got some nice tree canopy here. Um, and this pool right here, this is a spruce pool. This is one of the pools that I swim at in the summertime. And I thought it was just ideal in the sense that they did a really good job of calming the rate at which traffic moved through here. They narrowed this lane. They gave a little bit of a buffer here, but it's really hard to see. But right there is a mark on the pavement that helps contain those parked cars. It keeps them far over there so that we prevent the, the dreaded dooring effect. Too often, we're putting bike lanes right up next to the cars that are parked there, and then cyclists are being doored because it's very difficult um, you know, to avoid when a door suddenly uh, uh, gets thrown right out at you. So design really does matter. They don't all have to look alike. They don't have to look the same. Rather than uh, the ubiquitous white sticks, I'd love to see armadillos. Hey, that, that's a good one for, uh, for, for Texas, right? But this is in Barcelona. And these little guys, if a car actually hits that, they're going to notice. In fact, it's going to push them back over. And what the great thing is, it's pretty tactical. It's pretty something that you can do as a temporary experiment. And you know what? You can even put a little bit more space in between there so that the cyclist can, can still be able to meander out of the lane in that sense. So what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't all have to look alike, but we have to understand that this is inherently going to be more inviting, is inherently going to seem and per be perceived as being safer than just some paint on the ground, than just some sticks. And so when you're talking about trying to motivate the sedentary population, or you're, more importantly, you're trying to motivate the vast number of people who say that, you know, they're interested in cycling, but they're very concerned. So there's an entire group of people that this type of scenario might help with. So we used to do this, though. You know, this actually is Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn. It was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. And it was designed prior to automobiles being everywhere. They designed these wonderful environments. And they were beautiful environments. And they were beautiful even at six degrees out there. And again, I'm blown away by all the people that I see out there walking and biking, even in very, very, very cold weather, the polar vortex. And these, these are transitions. So the message really is, if we're talking about a street, if we're talking about what Chuck talked about earlier in terms of a platform for creating value, for, for wealth creation, and for vitality to a community, we may need to start heading down this direction where we're talking about cars and people mixing and being able to proceed, being able to compel and encourage motor vehicle drivers to travel at human speed. So one of, I highly recommend this, this book. Um, uh, I believe uh, Victor Dover was here uh, earlier this past year speaking um, about this particular book. Highly recommend it. Um, very, very influential for me. And I, I, I can't recommend this enough if you haven't had a chance to pick it up. It is, to, to Chuck's point, it is a little bit pricey. But uh, Chuck, to answer your question, well worth it. OK. So I've got my mic guys around. OK, good. Looking for a couple of good examples of truly 
safe and inviting streets that you can think of. So I want to know the street, where it's located, and I want you to tell me why. Why it's a, a, a very you know, motivating place. I see one hand up in the far back over there. Then I need a couple more. Go ahead and put your hand up so you can see you. There you go. Do we have others over here too? I'm actually thinking it's probably two streets. Uh, being that we're all mostly here in college, we all know them. One is Rainy, and the other one's uh, Sixth Street. So I don't know if you know about those out there in Austin. Wonderful. And what makes it a special place, safe and inviting place? Uh, I would say all the social aspects about it. OK. <laughs> uh, have you ever been there? I have not been there, yes. You'll Thank love you. it. You won't remember it, but you'll love it. All right. <laughs> All sorts of definitions of what a street is, and that's kind of the whole point. The, the street, the definitions of streets have changed over the years. Yes, sir? Um, St. Charles Boulevard in New Orleans. It's the uh, oldest uh, transit street in the country. It follows the curve of the Mississippi, and it has uh, a wonderful combination of, of both upscale and medium and low-scale housing and institutions along the whole seven-mile route. Is that the one that has the, uh, the rail line going around? That's right. right. Down the middle? Right. That was put in there in 1849, uh, as a, pulled by uh, horses first and then transitioned to electric. Yeah. So what he's talking about, in, in New Orleans, there's this wonderful street. And um, in, in the area where the light rail runs, it's a grassy area. And when you look at a photograph of, of this particular street, it's, it's truly fascinating because you notice something's a little bit off. You notice something that looks a lot like Chuck's photograph where you saw the footpath worn there? The runners prefer to run on a softer surface. And so the runners now run right down the middle of the, the light rail in New Orleans, creating a nice little beaten path. The, the trains are going so incredibly slow that you know, as they see the tra train come forward, they just jump off you know, and go like, and then they jump back in, into the, you know, the, the grassy area. It's fascinating. Thank you very much for those examples. Hey, what do you think? Let's put your hands together. Stand on up. Active applause here. Those were awesome. We absolutely have to keep in mind that we need access to nature. It can be as simple as those street trees. It could be like this in Boulder, where uh, an entire class of, of kids are learning how to mountain bike. And if we've, if, we're done, if we've done a good job at incorporating you know, trails and pathways, this is on the, uh, in, in Minneapolis here. And it, it's incredibly important for us to get that connection to nature on a daily basis, on a daily basis. This is up in Duluth, Minnesota, on the lakefront there. That's Lake Superior, in case you're not aware. Absolutely beautiful. And so we need to think about these as, as opportunities. Um, my home in the Boulder area is actually just about a um, quarter of a mile from this trailhead. And it's simply a preserved open space. And rather than just letting that open space sit there and do nothing, they made sure that it became an asset. This is a view right at the, the pier in Kailua Kona. And you can see a variety of different types of activities. You're engaging different cultures. You're engaging different people. This is an example of what it looks like to have a park that you know, really converts itself. In the wintertime, this is cross-country skiing. Um, they were getting ready to set up. You can't see them. They're off to the side there. They're getting ready to, to get the, 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 the small midget kids soccer going. So wonderful aspects of it. And, and again, I can't help but you know, come back to the images from this week when I was in uh, you know, being able to explore the Riverwalk. Absolutely beautiful. This is also a, a wonderful um, slide to, to end the parks and trails uh, with. This is a pathway that goes into the national park. To the best of my knowledge, it's the only bike path that exists inside a national park, although yesterday I rode your bike path to a national historic park. That was pretty cool. All right. Yes. You didn't stand. I'll let that one pass. 
So other inv invigorating environments, when I was in LA, this was the environment that I found. I, I booked myself into a really old hotel, and guess what? I was on the seventh floor, and I got to walk up the stairs every single time. Hotel I'm in, uh, this time, wonderful, inviting stairs, walking up and down. Again, access to affordable rec centers and pools, recreation facilities. Um, hey, you don't have a lot of money? How about a free yoga class out on the lawn? Um, this actually stretches for quite some time. I think there was like 125 people at this, this yoga class that was being done on a Sunday morning. And this is an example of a corporate fitness center um, up in Rochester, um, Minnesota, so part of the Mayo Clinic. This is for their employees. Again, creating environments which invite people to live healthy, active lives. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is San Antonio right here, signature events, having inspiring events where you engage a large number of, uh, of your, your, your community as volunteers, and then inevitably it motivates other people to get healthy, get active. This is a, an example of a free event that's held every month uh, in Kailua Kona. It's called a P-Man, and uh, it's just a swim and a run, and it's, it's a lot of fun. And what it has done is it creates a low barrier to entry opportunity for people to change their lifestyle and, and get healthy. Opportunities for, for water as well. I've got about five minutes, so I need to uh, fly through this in, in just a little bit here. So. But this is an example of, again, connecting with communities and really main, making meaningful connections. Um, and, and sometimes it's, there's a double entendre to that. Sometimes there's a literal connection, and then sometimes it is about really connecting with the population. And again, listening to their needs and being able to get them engaged. This is an example in Kona of you know, 125 people coming out to get engaged, work on the trail. This is their neighborhood. And it was looking a little run down because the Parks and Rec Department didn't have uh, the time or the money. When you look at some of your, your older uh, communities and you, you really need to be able to work with and engage key members of that community, especially when you're starting to transform those environments, you, you, you've heard the word gentrification before. You want to try to make sure that you can guide them through positive change. So when we look at in taking action, these are the types of things that I want you to think. Once again, inviting and invigorating. Make sure you get outside your silos, your areas of expertise, and have a good appreciation for where other people are kind of coming from. It's absolutely important for the bike guy to think a little bit differently, understand where the planners and the engineers are coming from, and vice versa. And again, being able to take those small little incremental opportunities to trial things. Be tactical. Try things out. And again, when you look at the, the aspect of your, your lower to middle income um, neighborhoods and things, ac access is absolutely critical. Don't leave them hanging out there without access to vital resources and other activity assets. And in taking action, I want you to be inclusive. Think about all ages. Think about all abilities, not just people who you know, are young and vibrant and healthy, but everybody. And also, model the behavior you want to see. Everybody know what that means? That's right. That's the reason why I ride my bike from the airport to the hotel. That's the reason why I try to be authentic. I'm trying to model the behavior. It's a challenge that I gave to, to Chuck when I was up in, in Brainerd, is we really do have to model the behavior that we expect to see other, others do. So everybody take that into, into consideration and think of how you can do that. Because guess what? We as humans, we're a herding species. If we see other people out there doing it, it looks like fun, others are going to be more likely to do it. All right, real quick, I know we don't have a lot of time. There's Julia. She took me on a tour. Um, real quick, things that you're excited about in San Antonio right now. Shout them out. 
Spurs. Yeah, the Spurs. What else? Bike share. Yeah? Bike share. Bike share. Bike share. Saw the, that presentation earlier. Linear Creek Parks, absolutely amazing. So this is just going to um, cycle through and give some photos, but questions from the audience. We only have about two minutes or so, so uh, go ahead and, and a couple of quick questions. Yeah, in the back there. We're going to run the mic up to you real quick so everybody can hear. And by the way, this is being uh, recorded and broadcast, and so we certainly appreciate so that. So what would you say to communities that maybe don't want to be connected to other communities? Like, I can't mm -hmm. get to Alma's Park because there's a gun club between me and the park that's rented to the gun, mm -hmm. by the city for a dollar a year. Mm -hmm. So unless I want to get shot, I can't get to the park. And it's because we're the low-income neighborhood and the private city that lives next to the gun club probably doesn't want us walking through, my theory. Yeah, there, and that's a great example, too, of um, low-income neighborhoods being um, partnered up ne next to or near other you know, types of environments that are, are you know, dissatisfying or polluters or noisy or dangerous situations. So yeah, I mean, what, one has to think, well, what on earth is that doing here still after all this time? So it's a good question. That's a good challenge. I don't know that I have a specific example for that. Any other quick questions? Yes, in front. Gated communities, and also you talk about how nice some of these areas are mm -hmm. uh, that are really cold in the winter. What do you recommend about an area that's uh, it's 106 degrees in the summer and 80% humidity? Huh? Yeah, I mean, he, the, the real question here is, you know, gosh, you know, what about weather? I guess the whole reason I put some of the extreme photos up there of the extreme cold and the extreme heat, you know, out there, because some of those photos were done in really, really hot weather, too, is that if you have an inviting environment, if you have an environment that has some mechanisms to bring the temperature level down, like the environment that you have along the river walk with the trees, you can really kind of transform that to, to, to really work with the, the, the environment that you have, you know, the, the weather pattern. I mean, who can control the weather, right? So, but what you can do is you can, you can have, you know, can create inviting environments by thinking things through. The other thing is, too, is gosh, you know, when I'm in, in Minnesota and it's brittle, you know, brutally cold, or in Colorado and it's a brutally cold stretch, You'd be amazed at how many intrepid folks are out there doing it. And when other people see that, they're like, yeah, you know, we'll do that. Same with hot weather. It's, it's just a matter of framing. And again, we're herding species. If we see other people doing it, we will go out there and, and give it a try. OK? Do I have time for one more? One more, OK. In the back? No? OK. Yes, right here. I'm stalling because I do have photo, more photos of uh, San Antonio. <laughs> yes, I can open up the bike too. Um, as a new urbanist in a comprehensive way, what would you recommend the central Texas area to become an active town? Because it's, it's growing so rapidly. What is your key recommendation on how to become those active towns in all these neighborhoods with all that's happening, the weather, gated communities, lack of access, land use changes, et cetera. So really, if I understand the question you know, correctly is, you know, gosh, given the challenges that we have um, in the central Texas area and the fact that you know, much of it is really, really built out, it's really sprawled out, um, what do we do? Take it incrementally. Do it neighborhood by neighborhood with the, the vision of thinking connectivity and trying to connect people to meaningful places, um, but tackle them. Uh, start being serious about you know, tackling the legislative side of things from the legal side of things, of making it OK to bring traffic speeds down in environments where you're trying to create value, where you're trying to, you know, gosh, why should we be driving 35 miles an hour through a residential area? Okay. And the good news is, is, is the state of Texas has actually um, accepted the CNU and ITE guidelines. And so you can actually build a 10 foot wide uh, lane now, travel lane, and bring the speeds down to you know, human speeds, reasonable, reasonable speeds here. Um, 
I think I need to wrap this up. And I wanted to just you know, thank everybody for this opportunity. The slides are going to continue to go here to get to, through San Antonio. Uh, if you have to get out of here right away to get to your next session, the last slide says, go Spurs go. Thank you. <laughs>